You need a Bible and a pen or a pencil, please, as we turn to the book of Galatians. Chapter 1, our focal text this morning, will be found in verses 6 through 10. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. And I want us to think together this morning about a disturbance in the church, and it had nothing to do with the sound system. It's a disturbance in the church. And I want you to keep your pen or pencil handy because as we read this text this morning, as we set the table for what the Lord has for us from the scriptures, I want you to circle six words, six words. Beginning in verse six, Paul says, I am amazed. If you would please circle that word amazed, or it may be the word astonished, depending on your particular translation of the scripture. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him. Circle the word deserting. Deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you. If you would, circle the word disturbing. Disturbing you and want to distort, circle the word distort, the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. If you would, circle the word accursed. Now in verse 9, as we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Again, circle the word accursed. Finally, in verse 10, for am I now seeking the favor of man or God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still striving to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. What a great text of scripture. I want to ask you a question before we dive headlong into unpacking the significance of this text. Did you know that the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke informs us that sleep is an important part of our daily routines. Did you know that you spend about one third of your life asleep? That's interesting, is it not? Getting enough quality sleep is as essential as, uh, to our survival as food and water. It's very interesting. Accordingly, without sleep, you can't form or maintain the pathways in your brain that let you learn and create new memories. And it's harder to concentrate and respond quickly. Sleep is important uh, to a number of brain functions, including how nerve cells communicate with each other. In fact, your brain and body stay remarkably active while you sleep. Recent findings suggest that sleep plays a housekeeping role that removes toxins in your brain that build up while you are awake. Sleep affects almost every type of tissue and system in the body, from the brain, heart, and lungs to metabolism, immune function, mood, and disease resistance. Research shows that a chronic lack of sleep or getting poor quality sleep increases the risk of disorders including high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity. The bottom line, church, is this. Good sleep is good for you. However, I look around the room this morning and I see a lot of you who are just settling into the pew hoping to get comfortable and take a little nap during the next 25 minutes of the sermon. Why is that? Because you did not get a good night's sleep. Why? Because you experienced what we call a disturbance in your sleep. Now I want you to think for just a moment about all the causes of disturbed sleep. Probably the most popular is getting up to go to the bathroom. Your neighbor's barking dog, heartburn, chronic pain, sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, stress, your phone, your snoring spouse, nicotine, caffeine, your sleeping environment, and your lifestyle can all disrupt, disrupt your much needed sleep cycle. These disturbances can affect you more than you may realize. 
Now, why am I telling you all this? Here's why. What is true with sleep is also true in the life and health of the church. A disturbance in the church can create a variety of problems and difficulties. And usually, behind every disturbance in the church, there is a person and or persons creating the disturbance. With all of that said then, I want to set before you this morning three principal headings to assist us in understanding the enormity of what Paul is saying in Galatians 1, verses 6 through 10. First of all, in verse 6, I want you to see those who disturb are deserters. Secondly, in verse 7, those who disturb are distorters. And in verses 8 through 9, finally, I want you to see those who disturb, Paul says, are doomed. Now, back to verse 6, if you would. Look at this verse again, and we see clearly that Paul makes it obvious that those who disturb are deserters. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Now, as you can hear, this is such a pointed and piercing statement to the churches in Galatia. Paul is beside himself. The, the New American Standard translation uses the word amazed. But other translations like the ESV uses the word astonished. The bottom line is Paul is amazed. He is astonished. He is alarmed. He is shocked. If he was Captain Kirk on the USS Enterprise, he would be calling for a red alert. This is desperate. Not only is he alarmed, but he is downright stunned. I am amazed. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. The apostle in his urgency, you note, there are no words of warmth and affection. No warm fuzzies coming from Paul to the churches of Galatia like he does in many of his other letters. Not in this letter. Paul is outraged. He is shocked. There is a disturbance in the church. In his mind, this is a bona fide crisis. Something must be done. And his letter bears forth the earnestness of a man who is trying to stop the bleeding, to stop a disaster before more damage can be done. Now this begs an important question, does it not? What had happened? What has Paul all stirred up? What is going on that Paul is, in, in our modern vernacular, Paul is freaking out. He is losing it. Why? What had happened? It turns out that apparently someone brought word to Paul that the Galatians were adding the law of Moses, in this case, circumcision, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let me remind you from last week again, they wanted to make the Gentiles, that is the Judaizers, they wanted to make the Gentiles become Jews before they could become Christians. In other words, they wanted to add works of the law on top of faith in Jesus Christ as the basis for salvation. And Paul is splitting in two. And the reason he is doing this is because it is a false gospel. It is a heresy of the first order to add works to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul was concerned that these disturbers then would influence others to walk away from the Christian faith. The text says that they were turning away. The word Paul uses is deserting. The word deserting, by the way, carries with it a military context for traitors and turncoats. The Galatians were betraying their allegiance to King Christ and going over to the other side. And Paul is perplexed by how quickly they were leaving the faith. Not only were they leaving the faith, but they were doing so quite quickly after having responded to the gospel preached to them by the apostle Paul. No wonder Paul is beside himself. Let me tell you another reason why he's just outraged at this. Because Paul had known such fruitfulness 
in his gospel preaching ministry in this region. You may recall that in Pisidian Antioch, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas after hearing the gospel. The word of the Lord, according to Acts 13, was spreading throughout the whole region like wildfire. In Acts 14, at Iconium, a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed in Christ. In Lystra, Paul and Barnabas were welcomed like gods. They were like rock stars when they showed up and preached the gospel, and the response was so encouraging. At Derby, they preached the gospel to that city in such a way that the Lord blessed and brought about many converts and disciples. In other words, church, sinners were saved. Miracles performed, churches were planted, God was glorified, Christ was lifted up, and the church was strengthened. And as soon as Paul left, in came the Judaizers, and in no time at all, the church began to give up on the gospel. And Paul, in his mind, is like, how fickle can you be? How fair weather, how flaky. They were willing to walk away from the good news about the cross and the empty tomb. The good news of God's grace, dear church, is his unmerited favor for undeserving sinners. And the gospel declares that Jesus Christ died and rose again to save us from sin. How the Galatians could turn away could desert this gospel was beyond Paul's ability to comprehend. And he says, I'm amazed. I'm astonished that you could so quickly desert this gospel, this Christ. Now I want you to look with me at verse 7. And notice here what Paul says about those who disturb. He says, those who disturb, not only are they deserters, but they are distorters. Verse 7 says, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. That's a very important word, distort. They wanted to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, who were these people? Obviously, the text does not say specifically who they were. Maybe Paul knew and simply didn't say. Whoever they were, this we do know, they were causing a disturbance in the church. They were creating trouble. They were stirring up difficulty. They were agitators. The truth is, there are agitators in every church. John Stott makes this astute observation. He says this, quote, The church's greatest troublemakers now and then are not those outside who oppose, ridicule, and persecute it, but those inside who try to change the gospel, end quote. The Galatians were turning away from God and his gospel of free grace. Now, if you don't hear anything else, please hear this. The good news of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, is the only gospel there is, period. The Judaizers basically set forth that if you want the full gospel, then you need to be circumcised in order to get it. And there are those in every church who think they know better than God. Oh, they promote Christ, all right, but they add to Christ and they take the gospel further only in a distorted fashion. The problem is, the problem is that many Christians today sitting in the pews cannot distinguish between the true gospel and the false gospels. It's a real and present danger. The church today worships many gospels. You say, all right, preacher, name one. All right, I will. I'll name several. First of all, there's the material prosperity gospel, which teaches that Jesus is the means to financial gain. There's the gospel of family values, which suggests that Jesus is the way to a happy home. There's the gospel of self, which teaches that Jesus is the way to personal fulfillment. There's the gospel of religious tradition, which teaches that Jesus is the way to respectability. And then the gospel of morality, which teaches that Jesus is the way to be a good person. There's the gospel of the latest trend and fad, which teaches that you must follow the trends of the church down the street 
in order to be considered relevant and follow the latest, most trendy opinions about Jesus. Now, what makes these other Gospels so dangerous is that the things they offer are all very beneficial. There's nothing inherently wrong with having wealth. There's nothing wrong with having a happy home. I want a happy home. There's nothing wrong with being well-behaved and being moral. And as good as all these things are, they are not the good news of Jesus Christ. Let me add to that. You know, being pro-life, that's not the gospel. A drive toward church growth is not the gospel. Mastering managerial leadership techniques is not the gospel. Feeling good about yourself is not the gospel. Making America great again is not the gospel. Works and man-centered methods are not the gospel. Selfishness and wanting your own way, that's not the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, Philip Ryken, I think he's correct. He says this. He says, the most dangerous teachers are the ones who preach a different Christ, but still call him Jesus. End quote. Dear church, we are not allowed to reinvent to rebrand the Jesus of the Holy Scripture to make him more like how we want him. We can't do that. Why not? Because it's not our gospel. It's God's. Listen further. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the messenger. <laughs> the gospel that Paul preached it's not the true gospel because it was Paul who was preaching it. It is the true gospel because it was the risen Lord who gave it to Paul to preach. And because the gospel is God's, there will never be another. There will always be those who distort the gospel and disturb the church. And frighteningly, I want you to see what Paul says about them and their fate in verses 8 and 9. Here he says, he talks about those who disturb, those who distort. They're doomed. These are frightening verses. Listen, listen to this, verse 8 and verse 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Verse 9, as we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. God's word outright rejects the very notion of God ever giving a new gospel. The good news of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone is the only gospel there is. And furthermore, this is... Without a doubt, some of the strongest language that Paul ever employs in any of his epistles. And essentially, he says that anyone who preaches anything contrary to the gospel he preached, whether it is an angel from heaven or Paul himself, Paul says, let him be accursed. That's strong language, dear church. In other words, he's, he's like, I don't care who it is. If they preach something different, they deserve to go to hell. That, my friends, will not read well in a Hallmark card. I'll give you a moment to catch up. <laughs> the true gospel is not only the one Paul preached, but also the one the Galatians received. And anyone who preaches anything different is to express it literally. This is interesting. To express it literally. In the original language, the word differs. Sorry. The word differs <laughs> from... Sorry, I forgot I don't have my mic on. The word differs. The one time I get out from the pulpit, I don't have a microphone. The word differs from the English, language, the English word, which is accursed. 
But in the Greek, it is the word anathema. The word accursed, it, it has, you know, it's kind of SD, standard definition. But in the original language, it is HD, it's high definition because the Greek language is so much more precise than the English language. And Paul says the word he uses is anathema. It is a frightening word. To be anathema, church, is to be under the divine curse, like the Canaanite cities that God utterly destroyed. And Paul is saying that he would be damned if he ever preached another gospel. False preachers, false teachers were proclaiming a false gospel. And Paul says, Anyone who teaches another gospel is subject to the wrath and curse of God. I don't know about you, but that is, that's a bold statement. And I suspect if I said something like that to anyone in this congregation, you'd run me out on a rail. How could Paul say to the churches of Galatia, if anyone, even an angel from heaven, or even if I were to preach another gospel, besides the one you heard and accepted and received, let him be accursed. How can he say that? I'll tell you how he can say it. Look at verse 10. It's because Paul was not too concerned about pleasing man. Paul was one of those rare men who did not live to please anyone but God. I'm not sure any of us would like being friends with Paul very long. And I'm pretty sure you wouldn't want him as your pastor. <laughs> He's tough. Tough as nails. Because his only concern was pleasing God. One theologian I read this week, he said this. He says, pleasing God and pleasing men are mutually exclusive. Maybe there's some real truth to that. Furthermore, I'll tell you one more thing. If you have put your faith and hope in Jesus Christ for your salvation, then hear this. You don't have to strive anymore for God's favor. You already have it. You already have it through the death and resurrection of Christ. Because of Jesus, who he is and what he did, you have favor with God. Think about that free, unmerited, undeserved grace of God. How good is the God of the Holy Scripture? He's incomparably good and great. And so on this great truth, we cannot find ourselves asleep at the wheel. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing else. In a very real sense, there is a sense in which we ought to lose sleep if we find ourselves wandering from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I close by asking you this. Why would anyone want to leave the God we love? And why would anyone want to leave the God who loves them? God has given us free grace at the expense of His Son, Jesus Christ. Will you now put your trust in Jesus Christ alone? May God give us the strength and the discernment and wisdom to guard the gospel and not allow a disturbance of this nature to take place in our church. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we thank you for the privilege to be in worship today, to come to your house, to gather with your people, the body of Christ, to gather around your word, and to receive this instruction. It's your word. It's not mine. I'm just a mouthpiece. This is your word, and so it carries with it inspiration and authority. And I pray that you will help us to guard against adding anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the truth of the gospel that speaks to 
the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord, all according to the Scriptures. And thank you that anyone who will put their faith and confidence in Christ will be justified before you, reconciled to you. I pray, Father, that we would resist all the temptations to distort the gospel and especially to desert the gospel. Help us to be fully tethered to Christ and Christ alone. Thank you that our salvation has been purchased at a tremendous price, but it is free to us if we will but receive the grace extended to us from your hand through the Lord. I pray that you will have your way with each of us in these closing moments of this time of proclamation. May your name be exalted. May our wills be aligned with yours, and may our responses be pleasing to you this morning. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet, and we're going to extend what we call an invitation. It's simply a time for you to respond, for you to decide. I'm of the opinion that every time the Word of God is opened and read and explained and exhorted, it demands some kind of response on the part of the hearers. How will you respond today? Perhaps your response would be simply to put your confidence in Jesus Christ to cease trying to earn favor with God by what you do or say or where you're seen or who you're with. Cease doing all that and put your faith in Jesus, trusting only Him to be your Savior and follow Him as Lord. If you're already doing this, perhaps where you stand in just a moment, you would thank God for this incredible grace that He's extended to us through Christ. And perhaps you would ask Him to guard your heart and mind from ever willingly or unknowingly adding to the gospel and help us may God give us courage in this age to live faithfully to defend the gospel